Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate, thanks for joining me on this special podcast. Great to be back, Owen, and for another video podcast. Yes, another video podcast. So if you're listening to this, you can actually watch it on YouTube. So head on over to the Rask Australia YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch this very special episode. And why I say this episode is so special is we have Amy Lenardi with us today. Amy, how are you going? I'm good, thank you. Fantastic. I'll let you do the intro to yourself, but one of the things that Amy and I had talked about and even and Kate and I had talked about in the past is we don't have enough property content. Property is such a big and meaningful part of people's lives, yet we've done maybe one episode, maybe two episodes on the subject. So we thought, hey, why don't we just get an expert in who can give us their, uh, the, the rundown and, and share with us their story. So Amy, you're that person, no pressure. Why don't we start off with just you telling us and the audience a bit about yourself, why you got into property and, and what you do now. Absolutely. So first of all, thanks for having me because I've been listening to your podcast from the very beginning. So big fan. Um, so I'm a buyer's advocate. So for anyone who doesn't know what a buyer's advocate is, I'll explain that in a moment. Don't worry. Um, but I've been in the property industry for about eight years now. Before property, I studied economics. So I worked in economics for state government, which is completely opposite to property. Mm. <laughs> totally opposite pace. And I worked for state government because I thought I've done this degree, I've got to put it to good use, even though I was never really interested in or passionate about economics. So I worked at state government for a little while, realised that was not for me. And then I started a small business. Um, do you remember those people who used to knock on your door and install the energy efficient products in yes. the Victoria? Like oh, yeah. the light bulbs and the power boards. So I worked the state government who administered that scheme and I thought oh, I could do this so I had to leave there and I started a business and I had about like 20 door knockers working for me at one point <laughs> um, and it was something that I just I really didn't enjoy doing but it was it was lucrative so I did that for a little while that that was what enabled me to build up enough money to start considering investing in property because my accountant suggested it to me and I thought I think I was in my mid-20s mid at the time, I thought, oh, investing is just for rich people. And I just had no idea, no idea at all. And once she planted that seed, I, I researched it a little bit and that, that sort of sent me on that, um, that quest to find out more about property. I'd always been interested in property. So whilst I was doing that business, I then started my master's in property. I got a job in residential leasing to get my foot in the door because it's, it's, you've got to get into the industry somehow. Um, and then I was very lucky enough to get an entry level position as a buyer's advocate, which is actually quite hard to do. A lot of people come into that industry with some other previous experience, like being a sales agent. Um, and then I, uh, in terms of my own personal port property port portfolio as well, using that original money I saved up from my business, I bought two properties in pretty quick succession at the start. And then I've been building my portfolio from there ever since. So I am an advocate who not only, I guess, talks the talk, but I've walked the walk as well, done renovations, I've done a bit of property development too. So I um, think fairly well-rounded there. <laughs> mm. And so you said that you bought a couple of properties to begin with. How old were you when you started investing in property? So that was six. I think I was about 27. Right. Okay. So yep. fairly young to have just, I guess, not, not fairly young, but I guess it is in some respects to have multiple properties, uh, even before you're 30, you say. Um, there's a lot to dig into because of everything that's happened recently. But I suppose Kate and I were wondering, not so much because it's a new industry, but because it's something we hear a lot more of these days, which is a, a buyer's advocate or a buyer's agent. Everyone's pretty familiar with real estate agents and what they do mm -hmm. and, and kind of how they 
you know, they drive the BMW and they, they, they show you the house <laughs> and, and all that. And they welcome you to the, to the auctions and that type of thing. And they wear really nice yeah. suits. But I guess there's a few misconceptions about what a buyer's advocate or buyer's agent is. So maybe you can take us through what it is you do day to day and how you help people buy their first yeah. home or their next home or an investment property. Absolutely. So I'm also a licensed real estate agent. It means I have my, my full license. Um, right. But as opposed to the selling agent, I work on the other side of the fence. So I work exclusively for the buyer. It's actually quite a, quite common, for example, in America to have a seller's agent and a buyer's agent in the same transaction. In Australia, it's not so common, but it has been increasing in popularity because like the selling agent, I represent my client throughout the whole transaction. But unlike a selling agent, I can go out to market and canvas all property stock available, whereas a sales agent can only sell their particular product, whether it's their listing or their office's listing. So my job is more advice-based, and I generally work with clients on average for longer than a sales agent would because we're there for them until they buy a property, whether that takes a week or a year, however long we need. And I'm there from the very beginning right from the start when we talk about creating a strategy. We're sitting down, talking about that goal setting session, talking about all of the things that we need to have in that property brief, and then actually going out, helping them find it, doing all of the due diligence, negotiation, auction bidding, post-sale, everything that it, that's involved from start to finish and, and holding their hand throughout that, that whole journey. And we, um, we buy on average between three and five properties per week. We're a very small wow. company, but yeah, so in comparison to a normal buyer who might buy a property a couple of times in their lifetime, we do this every single day. We're looking at properties every day, negotiating, doing analysis. So it, it, you know, it's fair to say we're just experts in the field and we've come across so many different scenarios. It can be very straightforward in buying a property, but it can also be very complicated. And there, there is a lot of risk involved. And our job is to minimise the risk through the purchase, but also... Uh, be able to help the client choose an asset that's going to perform in the long run. Mm -hmm. And property is one of the biggest assets that we're going to buy in our lifetime if we choose to buy. And so I think as a young person, for me, the idea of buying property is crazy daunting compared to buying ETFs, which is something I'm familiar with now. And I think having someone who can walk you through the process and talk you through the steps like negotiation, because that's not a skill we um, know from school, and yeah. sort of help you through that process. Do you go to um, auctions with clients as well? Yeah, so I bid at auctions on average one to two auctions a week. Okay. Um, and I, I always do the auction bidding. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't allow the client yeah. to do it. It's, it's my, it is my, um, I, love, I love doing auctions. I have it, we, as an advocate, we always have a competitive advantage, whether it's during the auction bidding or what a lot of people don't think about is what happens if a property passes in. They, always, they never plan for that and then they'll go inside, they get put under a lot of pressure, that's mm. our time to shine and a lot of people never even think that that's going to happen, let alone get ready for it. So can you explain that for us a bit? Can you uh, just explain what, what do you mean by when a property gets passed in and then what you yeah. do to get a yeah. good outcome? So a property will be passed in if it doesn't meet the reserve during the auction. So the reserve is the price that the vendor is willing to sell that property at. So if the bidding doesn't get at, up to that level, and I'm talking about this is um, uh, you know specific to um, you know the vendor can change their reserve throughout an auction too. So this is what some people forget as well. So they might increase it at last minute, they might decrease it, um, and this is something that is totally um, flexible depending on perhaps how the auction is going as well. For example, if there's a lot of bidding, the agents might put it on at a at a lower point um, but what happens is that if it doesn't meet reserve it gets passed in to the highest bidder at that time the person holding the highest bid they will then take that person inside and they will exclusively negotiate with that person they'll give them the opportunity to buy it at the reserve or they'll open up to negotiations if they can't pull a deal together they'll go outside and, and talk to that next person so People, don't, people just don't plan for that. They come inside. Every agent is totally different in how they negotiate. Some agents will say, all right, you've got five minutes. If you don't pay this, I'm going to that person. Some people will allow more time. Everyone's different. And it is, it's a very emotional time for 
a buyer and they, they're often not thinking straight. So, you know, we mm. come in there with a level head, we've got a game plan in place, we know what we're going to say, and then it's very interactive with our client. This is what the agent's saying, this is what we're going to be doing next, and we guide them through that process. They don't they don't ever come inside with us. Mm. All right. Yeah. yeah, and I think that probably takes away some of the emotional uh, purchases where suddenly you're hundreds of thousands of dollars above what you were planning to spend and it's Absolutely. not it's not even within your price range anymore. We always have a set budget before the auction and that is our absolute maximum walk away figure and we don't pay a dollar more and that still holds in a pass in as well. Because the point of doing that, point of setting that price before the auction is you're doing it under rational circumstances rather than in the heat of the moment. Mm. I always find when you go to an auction, one of the first things you do is you scour the, 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 the audience or the crowd and, and you get and you think, oh, that person's a first time buyer. That one, it looks wealthy. That one is there with their parents. <laughs> like you, you, you scour the room because you, it's like you want to know who's who you're competing against, right? It's like if you're lining up on a netball court or a football oval, you want to know who you're coming up against. And yeah. I've heard plenty of stories where, you know, buyers agents or even, you know, friends, um, older friends have come into the auction and done the bidding, not only just from an emotional point of view, but also from that kind of psychology point of view where you can uh, psych out the competition and someone thinks, you know, if you've got a first home buyer coming up against a, a property developer, the, the property developer is like a piece of cake. I'll, I'll take this person. Yeah. No worries. And so I guess having you there, that it's kind of like this mystery buyer behind the scenes. And you're the expert that can kind of get rid of all the emotion too, right? Confidence is the number one thing. I often have people who um, ask me for bidding tips and I say, all you need to, like if I was giving one overarching tip is, is having your budget prepared prior and then just bidding confidently up to that level. That's all you need to do. You can overthink it. And we have a lot of strategies that we use, but as a first time bidder, um, you, you will overwhelm yourself if you think about it too much. It's, just, it's having that confidence. It's pretending like you've got $20 million to spend, even if you're coming right up to the close end of your budget, because whether it's consciously and subconsciously, other people will be able to read your body language. Mm. One, one question before we move on to kind of the next talking point, I just wanted to ask is, it all sounds wonderful. And, you know, I, I really like the idea of a buyer's agent, but to give the listener base maybe something to grab onto how much would it typically cost i'm not saying like your cost specifically but yeah. typical cost for a buyer's agent let's say i don't know i'm a first-time buyer i'm looking at a house of six hundred thousand dollars yeah so what i can tell you is that there's two different types of models there's flat fee or mm. there's percentage based so we are flat fee for example so whether you're spending three hundred thousand or three million dollars it is the same price there are advocates who charge a percentage Mm. Um, we don't we don't do that. I mean, it's our job to buy the property for the, the least amount possible. I actually mm. don't think it's appropriate to be incentivised as on a percentage basis mm. on the buying side. But from a cost perspective, it varies so much because there's so many different advocates out there, and they all specialise in certain uh, avenues. They all offer different kind of packages. Um, whether you just want them to negotiate on one particular property. Or where, right. whereas you want a full service where you're, or if you're buying into state and you're not located locally, there's, there's it ranges so much. So, I, but I think that um, it is possibly more cost. Um, it's, it's probably more doable than a lot of people realise. And I think if you do search around, you can generally find an advocate which fits into your particular budget. Yeah, great. And I mean, the the value proposition is. I guess maybe in some respects, I'm not saying this is always the rule, but maybe it's one of those things where you spend a little bit more, you actually save a lot more. And, you know, a costly mistake at auction is probably not the type of costly mistake you make when you walk into a Harvey Norman or a, or a Bunnings <laughs> warehouse where you actually spend a bit more. You're, you're talking right. potentially about tens of thousands of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the property. So having that expert there can definitely help. Um, Kate, what, is there anything you wanted to ask Amy with regards to property right now? Um, well, I think a lot of people have been asking, is now the perfect time to invest in property? And I know I was discussing this with Owen because currently we can, under certain seconds, take money from our super. There's the 5% scheme. There's the, you can put money into your super for buying a property. So there's a lot of different schemes and things available at the moment. So is, is now a good time for young people to invest in property? Yeah, so great question. And I'm going to break it down into a couple of sort of 
key key things there because we're in a really unique time. Yeah. I think with any kind of investing, the longer you can hold the asset, the better. So the short answer to that is when's the best time to invest in property is yesterday. And I say <laughs> that from a metaphorical perspective, not like specifically on Tuesday, yesterday. Yeah. Um, but because property is a, um, it's an asset that compounding growth will reward you over the long run. Um, the longer you can hold it, the better. There's a lot of transaction costs in property. You've got stamp duty if you're not using these first home buyer schemes. You've got selling costs and so forth. So you do need time to be able to give you the returns. And you also want to be able to have time to ride out any fluctuations in the market. So we've had a couple of cycles recently up and down. The longer you can hold that property, the more you'll smooth out those returns. So that's just the generic investing advice, I suppose. Yeah. Um, specific, specifically around right now, though, I think that this is this is stating the obvious, but anyone who has any kind of concerns around job security or cash flows or income, they shouldn't be purchasing a property. They mm. should be building up their buffers and making sure they've got that confidence, not only around being able to support that loan, but even right now, things have changed where banks are doing spot checks just prior to settlement on your employment. So previously, if you were subject to finance and say you get formal approval, that's it. Basically, you're good to go. But now they're checking just before settlement. So if you've got a 90-day settlement and you lose your job just before you settle, obviously a big problem in itself, but you might get um, have issues with your loan. So that's, that's very, very relevant. Mm. So anyone who has confidence around their job and who has adequate buffers in place, I think that now is a time to definitely start exploring it. And because a lot of people need that time to be able to actually figure out what their cash flows are, what their goals are, do, do that bit of research. The sooner you can do that, the better. I'm not going to forecast in terms of what I think is going to be happening later in the year because I actually think it's really dangerous for people to be forecasting because it is impossible to predict. Now, if we look back at what happened in the last market cycle, for example, start of 2019, all of the top economists said that the market was going to continue to decline throughout 2019 between 1% and 10%. And what actually happened? Mm. We had an election. We had APRA easing restrictions. Um, we had a, a flick of the light switch in sentiment. And we had a significant increase to the point where October last year was the biggest capital growth increase in one month ever. Mm. Nobody predicted that. So the problem with predictions or reading too much in the media or, or listening to people that, that don't actually know what's going to happen is it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you watch today tonight and it says the sky is going to fall and the market's going to drop 40%, you're going to, you're going to especially if you're a risk-averse person, you're going to listen, put too much waiting on that mm. and then you're going, your actions will be guided by that. So I think that by getting too much into this negative media, that can actually create a worse outcome than if you just basically uh, make a decision based on the right time for you. So I don't think timing the market is ever possible in property, which is we've, we've seen in the last few years. So you've just got to make sure it's the right time for you. Um, I can talk about the background into what happened around the last cycle just really briefly. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. Run through, because we can, we've can we learned a lot about human behavior from that. Yeah, so sure. So the last downturn was caused by um, uh, it's basically a credit crunch. So APRA prim primary goal was to um, reduce the amount of investors in the market. So they increased LVR requirements, interest rates, um, the amount of investment loans that they could provide. Um, and then we also had this big push around responsible lending because we were coming up to the Royal Commission. So banks were being, people's borrowing capacities were dropping significantly, 10, 20%, sometimes more. Or all of a sudden they went from a position where they could borrow something to, to borrowing nothing. So we had a big uh, drop in demand because of that. And because that was the first time the property market in, in Australia had dropped or in Melbourne had dropped for such a long time, people thought, people who didn't understand what was causing it thought, oh gosh, I've got to wait. I'm going to wait and see what happens. And that made the market drop more than it should have. And then we had people sitting back for a quite a long time, people who, some people who genuinely were waiting for this to happen, they were complaining about prices rising <laughs> and they couldn't wait for it to fall. And then when they finally came down, they thought, oh gosh, not, I'm just going to wait for the bottom. Um, but the problem is no one predict, no one could predict when the bottom was. 
Um, and then after the election, things escalated so quickly because of that change in sentiment that if you weren't on the ball, you got left behind. So from the space of the election in May to September, we had prices recover um, almost as much, if not more than they had dropped in a very short period of time relative to the decline. So that was really interesting. And mm -hmm. then we're seeing that again happen now. People who are in a position where they, they can buy and all of a sudden there's less competition and more opportunity, but they're sitting back because of fear. And, you know, this is, this, this, this is where it comes back to your risk profile and figuring out, you know, how much you're going to sleep at night if you buy something and you're really fearful it's going to drop in value. Um, I just have to remind people that when you buy property, if, if it does drop in value on paper, you don't crystallise a loss unless you sell. But if you're going to lose sleep over that thought, then perhaps you should just wait because your risk profile doesn't, um, doesn't mean that you're going to be comfortable buying right now. Whereas a lot of other people, they need to weigh up the opportunity right now of being able to buy with less competition and um, off, a lot more off-market opportunities versus waiting and potentially having to then fight even even harder later on and having to compromise their brief. Mm, absolutely. And I think one of the things that young people maybe get a little bit confused about is whether they're buying a property for investment purposes or just a home to live in and maybe start a family or have pets and do all those sort of things and the different things you should be looking at and the different sort of money you should be spending on those two different types. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the key thing there is to figure out, and this is, is hard to do, you, you should be speaking to someone, mm -hmm. a, a professional about this, is, is it a home or is it an investment? Because even if we buy a home, we want it to be investment grade, but it's either or because they're serving totally different functions. Mm -hmm. For example, if you're buying a home, it's going to have the criteria that means it works for your lifestyle. If it's an investment, then it has to tick all those capital growth and rental prospects. And it might not be in an area that you want to live in, but if you're going to maybe live in it for a year to get the first time by a concession, you just might suck it up. That, that's the two key things that we need to figure out at the very beginning. Um, and then from there, we can figure out how much we should be spending. There's so many variables here. For example, there's certain people who are in certain industries where they know what their income tra trajectory is going to be like over time because say they work in government or they're in teaching and, and they understand what their cash flows are going to be versus someone who might have just finished uni and they're a lawyer or in the medical industry and they're going to go from this like this. Mm. They're going to make this different decisions based on that. So if you think that your cash flows won't be increasing too much in the long term, maybe you buy your long term house now um, versus someone else who maybe wait a little bit longer and save more because you can and, and buy that superior asset in one year or two years. So, so many different factors there, and I think it's hard to work out. The, the importance of, um, I love using spreadsheets. So being able to sit down with people, model out the cash flows a little bit, um, get them to play around with mortgage calculators and, and have a chat with them, but also even potentially speaking to um, a financial planner as well. It's interesting that you say about income. That's an interesting point you make about growth and income. And then obviously, um, well, in, in my opinion, what I've seen in the, in the numbers is that um, income is the sole determinant for borrowing power. So then if you think about borrowing power as a function of property prices, you know, people can access credit. That's effectively what turns the economy. The number one thing that everyone should be thinking about is their income and their income potential. And because mm -hmm. that kind of determines what you can spend. Um, and it also determines probably what happens to house prices long term. Um, yeah. One thing that I've kind of recognised from this recent, uh, you could say, uncertainty with the coronavirus and lockdowns and unemployment numbers is that we've got record low interest rates, which probably can't go much lower unless they go negative, which would be a bit weird. Um, but then you've got, you know, a property market coming off maybe a really hot patch, like you said, since October for the first time in a very long time. And then you've got, you know, people that might have a stable income. I think like for me personally, I think this is kind of like a, a, an opportunity for me over the next six months. And what might be a, sh a little bit shocking for some of our listeners being an investor that I am is that I've never owned a property because I've always invested in shares and ETFs and managed funds and those types of things. But now I see a real opportunity in so far as, or at least a potential opportunity. I'm not saying it's 
you know, across the board, this is a great buying market. I just think that um, some of the stars have aligned and, yeah. you know, longer term, Australia is still a fantastic place to be and to own part of the economy and own a property and et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that I did recently is I kind of did this survey of all of the different government grants and different, I guess we, we, they're called schemes, but we won't call them <laughs> schemes because I hate that word, but, <laughs> but it is, a, I guess that the whole thing is a scheme. Um, some of the things that we've looked at recently, we talked about on the podcast, things like the first home super saver scheme. Um, I understand like you would outsource that kind of consultation to a financial planner, but then we have a first home deposit guarantee, which is, I believe, right around Australia, although the, you'll, I'm sure you fill us in, very suburb to suburb or by postcode. Um, and then there are, I, I guess, just um, state-based grants or benefits with regards to stamp duty as well. So I, that's a lot to take in and not to answer in one question, but maybe you can um, distill some of the really important th- uh, opportunities that are on offer and the scheme, schemes once again the that schemes. are available. <laughs> yep. So there's 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 state schemes and then there's federal as well. Yep. So for example, in Victoria, for a little while we've had um, the stamp duty concessions, which means you may pay as a first home buyer no stamp duty up until six hundred thousand dollars, and then between six hundred and seven fifty, it's a sliding scale. So the more you pay, the less stamp duty concessions you get. Um, and the, there's also the, the first time buyer grant, which is often confused with the concession, which is for brand new properties as well. So in Metro, it's 10 grand, regional, it's 20. There's caps on this. So for a new home, it's up to 750. And it's, right. um, uh, I think there's more, de- there's more details in there as well. Um, because for example, if in, in the stamp duty concessions, you'd also be, eligible for concessions from an off the plan perspective if you spend more than 750 because your right. stamp duty is assessed on the land value not the purchase price uh, so okay. and it, yeah it can get quite complicated so i think that tapping into your local revenue state revenue office is important it can be kind of complex mm. when you're reading it all because it's like you're only eligible for this if you're eligible for this as well and then this is true and it's there's there's income limits and so many different things that I think I've actually had a lot of luck sometimes just calling the SRO and clarifying a point. They've been very good with that. Um, but these change over time too. So what might be in place now could change in a year's time and could change after that. So also don't don't rely on this always being the case if you're planning years into mm. the future. Yeah. So that's from a state level. Then from the federal level, level we've got this 5% deposit scheme which is what you're taking advantage of I believe Mm -hmm. yep so that's something that the government um, brought up just before the last election very good timing Mm -hmm. from them Um, and I thought it was actually quite hypocritical at the time because that was right in the depths of our responsible lending um, you know them pushing that on the bank so what it is is usually when you have less than a 20% deposit then you need to pay what's called lender's mortgage insurance. And this is for any buyer. So, and what that is, is that it's essentially the bank saying, if you're giving me less than a 20% deposit, I have some risk involved. Therefore, you need to take out this insurance to protect me if that person needs to sell that property and they can't recoup their losses. So it can be quite a lot of money, um, but it's just say it's 10, 15 grand, whatever it is, it's, about, it's based on how much deposit you have. It's added onto the loan and it's capitalised. So you're not paying that up front. You're paying it over the life of the loan. So it doesn't actually end up being a significant increase to your cash flows, but it is a cost. Mm. Um, so, and, and for a while as well, they've, banks haven't been too excited about 5% deposit. I mean, I, I borrowed 97% for my second property. Oh, wow. That was for an investment too. Gone are those days. Um, but... What the what this scheme is is for people who only have a five percent deposit. The government is guaranteeing that loan, so the government is stepping in kind of as that mortgage insurer and saying to the banks, "We've we've got this." Um, so if you've got five percent, you don't have to pay that hefty lender's mortgage insurance. Now, something that I tried to clarify before this call, and no one could answer for me, is what happens if you buy a house with a five percent deposit. 
and you're in a position where you are forced to mm. sell it and for some reason you have to sell it at a loss, I would presume that the gov- you would then owe the government that money because mm. that's what happens with LMI. I believe that that might be the case. That's something that you would want to be clarifying. So when you talk about, you asked me sort of my, my thoughts around the pros and cons of this. The pros is that obviously saving a deposit is the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles for people. And especially in a moving market, your money gets eroded because as prices go up, unless you're say out saving the market or your borrowing capacity is out pacing the market, you actually start getting left behind. So what I think it's good for is those people who are maybe coming out of study and they're going into these well-paid jobs where they've got good borrowing capacity and, and cash flows, but they want to be able to buy sooner rather than later and they just don't want that time to, to save up for the deposit. Um, my cons is that um, you do pay more interest over the life of the loan than obviously because you're borrowing more, this is the percentage mm-hmm. wise. Um, if you refinance, I believe you're no longer eligible for that support, so you've got to be careful around that. Um, the negative equity issue is just what I mentioned before. In my experience, first home buyers sometimes choose more riskier op- assets because they've got lower budget, for example, one bedroom apartments, which don't have the best growth prospects all the time. If they then have to sell, just say they get into strife um, and have to sell a year later, if they've lost money, then they could end up in a way worse position than when they started. Mm. Um, they also, I think it's the risk of people buying before they're ready. If they've only saved up 5%, maybe they haven't got that, those spending habits in place or maybe their parents have gifted that to them or something. Um, so maybe they don't have enough buffers in place after that. Just depends on the individual saving habits. Um, we've also got that first, um, first time buyer super saver scheme which is totally separate to that is a scheme where people um, can put money into super to help them save the deposit. And there's just the tax savings along mm. the way there. I don't think it's been particularly um, popular mm. because a lot of people don't understand it. Yeah, it is very, it's a, it's a bit more confusing this first home super saver scheme. And I think for a lot of people, like you can go online you can look at the calculators for it and, you know, it looks pretty appealing if you do it well over say two or three years, but, it also is very complicated and there's risk associated with that too. You know, you end up, let's say someone has full intention of using their maximum first home super saver scheme and then they get into a relationship with someone who's already bought a property and they want to buy a house together. Well, does that impact or what happens if you don't end up buying a house and the money's in super? And there's so many different things. There's like you said, there's pros and cons. One of the things that you mentioned there was um, obviously negative equity and you know, that's a, that's a pretty daunting thing for people to think that, Hey, I've got a loan of $500,000, but my house, according to realestate.com.au or domain or whoever you use says, Oh no, it's only worth 450 because prices have dropped. Like we haven't had that to any great extent recently because uh, prices have been going up, but again, but also th- because LVRs have not been 95%. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you've had to, you've been in some respects you've been forced to have a deposit or at least a guarantor, right? But I okay. guess one of the things again I'll come back to is um, borrowing power, and, and, and I guess that's a function of your income. So you said at the start of the call, one of the, like the I guess the disclaimers of any advice is kind of like if you are thinking of buying a property, you have that stable income, and you have to be true to yourself here because if you're not, you know, just just saying that you have a stable job and, and all of that is not going to help you when you when you lose a job. You know, you actually have to take stock of that. And we constantly talk about this idea of like lifelong learning, improving yourself, making yourself more employable, getting the job that you want. And this is a you know four to five year process. So I, I fully take on board your comments there around risks around this scheme and just any scheme in general. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier on the, the call is you said, you know, it's important to get investment grade properties. And then in that your answer to that question then you mentioned that first home buyers tend to take on properties that maybe aren't as high quality and they take more risk so one of the things for example if you look around the areas that i'm looking to buy if you spend up to six hundred thousand, which is where this five percent deposit caps out you're looking at you, oftentimes you 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 get search results that show houses that are you know it's a knockdown job or it's a it's more than tlc it's on a really steep block. It's on a really busy road. It's far away from public transport. Like there's all of these different things that kind of come into your mind and you realize, Hey, I'm okay. I'm a first home buyer, but I didn't realize it was this bad. 
Um, when you talk about investment grade and, and taking risk with the, the asset, can you just explain what maybe is an investment grade property? Yeah, absolutely. So again, coming back to, is it a home or is it an investment? If it's an investment, we want to tick all of these boxes. If it's a home, ideally we tick as many as we can, but your overarching personal lifestyle preference needs to weigh up a lot more there. So first of all, when we, we think about a property that is investment grade, what we're really talking about is that property um, outperforming the market in terms of capital growth. So the market can go up and down, but we want a property that outperforms other properties in that area, um, just as general, because different suburbs will perform differently, different states will perform differently. So the key thing that we're looking at is to have owner-occupier appeal. So investment quality, owner-occupier appeal, even if you're not living in it, because mm -hmm. owner-occupiers drive the market. Investors are fickle. And as we saw through the last downturn when investors were sucked out of the market, um, it's the owner occupiers who are the ones that will always have the demand and have the desire to purchase because home is a shelter. Mm -hmm. So from a capital growth perspective, we want to choose mm -hmm. properties that when we sell them, they will have broad appeal to the broad market and they will have people fighting for them. Um, so from a location perspective, we want to look at things like amenity, we want to look at things like proximity to city or local job hub, job hub, public transport. Why are people wanting to live there? Are they living there because it's aspirational or are they living there because they actually just can't afford to live anywhere else? Which, and there's certain, especially fringe suburbs in Melbourne where um, there's no transport. It takes you two hours to get to the city on the on the um, freeway, but people are only living there because they just really want three bedroom house and they can't afford to live somewhere else. So that's not an area which I would say has investment appeal. From a dwelling perspective, we want to look at things like um, we don't want to have any major compromises on that property. So like you said before, buying on a main road, you might be okay with that. But if we took a poll of, of everyone else, not many people would be happy to live in, on a main road or any other thing that's compromised with it, living, you know, too close to, to big power lines um, or living living close to the station is great, but living on the, next to the train mm -hmm. line, not so great. Um, so we want to make sure we don't um, cut out any segments of our market by choosing something that's a deal breaker for a lot of people. We also want to make sure that um, we're buying a property that the banks like. So if a bank isn't going to finance our property, um, then it's going to be hard for other people to buy it. So what I mean by that is we want to make sure we have residential zoning. If we have commercial zoning, then, um, and people might say, oh, why would a home be commercially zoned? There's actually quite a bit around, especially in inner city Melbourne, where right. you're allowed to live in there. That's totally fine, but the zoning is commercial. And especially if you're above a shop, which is quite common, you might be subject to a commercial loan and it'll be harder to get a loan. Um, banks also don't like things, for example, uh, floor plans less than 50 square metres. So for first home buyers buying a one bedroom apartment, that is a very relevant thing. Mm. Um, anything which the bank deems as risky and they don't like, you might be able to get a loan for it, that's fine. But when you go and sell it, you want everyone else to be able to finance that. We just, from an investment perspective, we want to make sure that there's low vacancy in the area, it's easy to rent. We'll talk to local property managers about that. Um, and then most importantly, making sure that your cash flows meet your long-term goals. Because you never want to put yourself in a position where you're forced to sell a property at, at the wrong time. Mm. And one of the things I first heard about when um, we did a live event earlier this year and we had Nicole Haddo who wrote Smashed Avocado speaking, she talked a lot about how she just saved the deposit, but she hadn't thought about saving for any of the other associated costs, <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> conveyancing. And suddenly she, uh, she was trying to pay for furniture and all of that sort of stuff and she didn't have any spare money because she just saved that um, deposits. So what are some of the unexpected expenses that we should be saving for on top of the deposit? Yeah. Well, I think in that instance, that's not even unexpected cost. That's just life cost. <laughs> um, and, but a lot of people, a lot of people, they just, their desire to get into the market mm. is so strong that they forget they have to live after that. Yeah. Not only do you need to live, but you need to be able to, um, I, I personally would feel uncomfortable if I didn't have around six months of savings in order to cover me if I lost my job and I had to keep making the mortgage repayments or 
or dealing with these 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 surprising things that come up. So with any first home buyer having that buffer in place or, or, or knowing you've got an emergency contingency plan, like borrowing money off your parents, you know people don't want to do that, but you need to know that that's there in the background. Mm -hmm. In terms of costs that can come up, um, you know, you've got th these things like furniture and moving trucks. I feel like that's one of the smaller costs. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your hot water system blows and that's going to be a couple of grand. Um, but some things like owners' corporations, Mm -hmm. So people who are buying into blocks with OCs, we always make phone calls to the owners corporation before we purchase to say, is there anything that's come up since the last meeting that requires possibly a special levy or some other cost that's not reflected in, in the minutes? Um, because the bigger the block you are, um, generally the more things you might have like lifts or pools, they do get costly to maintain over time. Um, even older blocks, oh gosh, cladding, make sure you you know if you're buying I, I would never recommend doing it but I still see people buying with cladding but you know that not only can be a big cost but that's a safety issue that's mm -hmm. very relevant um, at the moment um, when you're buying off the plan mm -hmm. I am not a fan of buying off the plan for many many reasons which we don't have time to go into right now but one big risk here is well first of all you don't know what you are going to going to be until completion but also there's a big risk of bank valuation shortfall. Mm -hmm. And what that means is just say you buy off the plan now and you set, spend 500,000 in one or two or three years when that property settles, the bank might value it at $450,000. You have to come up with that 50 grand shortfall somehow to settle. A lot of people don't realize that. That can also happen with an established property. Um, so whenever we're buying for clients that do have a higher LVR, we always run through the contingency plans there. If that happens, I don't see it happen very often with us because we do a lot of research. Mm. Um, but that's, that's, that's a totally hidden cost that yeah. not a lot of people think about. Mm. As you can see, there's up, so many, I'll, right? <laughs> and I'll quickly bring up guarantor loans because you were talking about ways for first-time buyers to get legs up through the government. Now, parental guarantor loans I, I love them. Um, I've used one. They're not right for everyone. But what it is, is essentially taking that, um, you might have a portion of a deposit, whether it's 5%, 10%, maybe a bit more, but your parents are wanting to help you out without necessarily giving you cash. So they um, allow a, a, a portion of their property to be used as security, 20%, which means you still don't pay LMI. You've got a 100% loan, but you can then take your cash and pop it in your offset account. So you've got a bit of liquidity there and you've got a bit of protection. Um, and the good thing is that the, the, the only risk to your parents is you not paying your loan. Mm -hmm. So they've got to feel confident with, with you and you've got to have that relationship. Um, and in time, once your property increases in value where it's got its own LVR for 80%, then you can release them. So I used this for my first property and I released my dad within... I think it was only two and a half years. Yeah. Um, not right for everyone. Not everyone's comfortable with it. I think parents who try and use it to force their kids to buy a property when their kids aren't ready for it, that's an example of when it can't work. Um, but speaking to a really good strategic mortgage, mortgage broker about the risks and getting your parents in and sitting down with them in that meeting, I think it's worth exploring. I think it's a great avenue. That's fantastic um, advice too. I think that... In the past, I've been very critical. So when people have asked us about these types of questions, I've said, well, you know, make sure you get your own deposit, do it your own way, you'll feel better about it. But that's really, um, that's my uh, kind of like general advice for anyone that um, <laughs> maybe I think, maybe doesn't have the, the cash flow down pat, doesn't have the budget sorted, because if they're asking mm -hmm. those questions first and foremost, and maybe, you know, there are some other issues with money there, and then the parents should kind of be the filter for that too. So I'm sure there'll be that's some right. parents listening to this that think, Maybe they've been asked a question recently, can you go guarantor? And I guess the big question there is, well, are they responsible with money? And, and, and do I trust them? Because, you know, it's very easy to get money in between family and money in between friends and, and colleagues, as we know, always kind of results in uh, some broken relationships. So I guess that's kind of the disclaimer there, right? I mean, there's well, so I put a business case together for my dad when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> he's, very anti, he's very anti-debt and I had to demonstrate the risk. And, and and everything that could have impacted him and he was okay with it in the end. But you're absolutely right. You need to be able to demonstrate to your parents that you're responsible and you're not doing it just because you've got no other options. 
Yeah, totally. I think that's a really good idea. Try and pitch it to your parents, like present some documents and be like, this is how I'm going to pay it. This is the cost of the house. This is what I need to yeah. do. Uh, that's a really good way to think about it. Um, Amy, uh, Kate, I should ask first, Kate, do you have any other questions for Amy? So Amy, at the moment during COVID-19, it's been quite different to see property inspections working differently and online auctions are starting to take place. And as you uh, mentioned before, private sales. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how buying a property is a little bit different right now. Yeah, so from a physical perspective, we obviously can't go to public auctions and public inspections anymore. So we have to organise private inspections, which is, which is fine, not much different. Some agents are doing these online auctions and they're investigating a lot of different platforms, which is great because I like the transparency of auctions. But what some other agents have done is converted a lot of auction campaigns to private sales. And in Melbourne, in specifically, a lot of buyers aren't used to private sales. They're used mm -hmm. to auctions. And the, the issue with a private sale is it's not as transparent. And every agency runs a different method of selling via private sale. Some of them have a uh, backwards and forwards process. Some of them have what's called a best and highest process where you only get one option to put an offer in and that's it. Um, so you need to understand the intricacies and the rules of the game with mm -hmm. private sales. And there's also these expressions of interest floating around as well, where some agents I've spoken to, I've said, well, what, you know, what's your rules of the expression of interest? And they say, oh, I'm not, not sure yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so everyone's trying to adapt. Um, but secondly, we've also had a lot more properties go off market and off market means that it's not going online at any point. So the only way to get access to them is actually via the real estate agent, whether you're on the database, you're constantly talking to them. Um, mm. And these properties will transact without you even realizing it if you're not having that dialogue and you're not reaching out. There's, and the reason why a lot more have gone off market is because there is uncertainty with vendors. They don't want to commit to a campaign, commit to marketing costs if for some reason that demand for their property isn't out there. Mm. Like you don't need to spend a lot of money taking fancy photos if no one can come in and look at it. Yeah, putting it online, it, it's quite expensive mm. to put a property online um, and then, you know, putting yourself under that, um, that time pressure if you do schedule in an auction. So, yeah, a lot, a lot more property selling off market right now. Mm. I think we've jam-packed enough information yeah. into this episode. Yeah, I think uh, it'd be great to have you back on, on the show sometime in the future. But in the meantime, Amy, um, maybe what, what you can do is just tell people how they can get in touch with you, maybe give a shout out to your new podcast, something like that. <laughs> so um, Amy Lenardi, I think that um, Instagram is actually a good way to connect because mm. it's got all my contact details in there. So it's Amy, A-M-Y underscore L-U-N-A-R-D-I underscore buyers underscore advocate. It's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> <It> is, <yeah. laughs> um, otherwise, um, our website, which is www.katebakos.com.au, C-A-T-E-B-A-K-O-S. We've got a podcast out at the moment called The Property Diary. Mm -hmm. So this is just a really generic property podcast. We talk about um, all things property. And then I have a specific first home buyer podcast coming out later in the year as well, which really brings it back to basics. Cool. We'll provide links and, and everything you need in the show notes. Um, so people that are listening to this, you'll be able to find out more about Amy and um, all of the resources she has available. But uh, I think on behalf of both of us, Amy, thank you mm. for taking the time out to join us. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Amy.